So with this in mind, an important question has come about is how do we encourage or provide the conditions that will enable or support older adults in particular to become active? So a question which was posed certainly in the 90s and, uh, and the early 2000s corresponds to preferences and that if we can understand what people prefer to do, they're more likely to actually stick with those and engage in those behaviours. So one question which has been posed corresponds to this these preferences for exercising alone versus others. And I provided some, some, some data in the previous um, slides, but what's particularly interesting of relevance to, to older adults, so data that was coming out of Stanford in the late 90s from Abby King's group, was suggesting that older adults were actually reporting a preference for exercising alone rather than in more social contexts. And I've, I've, I, at the time, as new professor at UBC, I found that particularly perplexing. And so why was that? And, and to me, those data raised for me three paradoxes. So, so first of all, why were older adults reporting a preference for, for exercising alone when prominent theory, certainly in psychology, were providing evidence that being with others is more innately natural than being alone? And the second paradox is that when, when studies ask younger adults, they also, but th these younger folks report a preference for more social contexts and not exercising alone. And then the third is when people do exercise with others, especially in groups that are cohesive, so as per that Burt Karen meta analysis, the levels of adherence are markedly superior than when exercising alone. So I was just perplexed at that time as to why are older adults reporting a preference that's less innately natural, least likely to be pr preferred by younger adults and less likely to support their long-term adherence behavior. So when I looked at this, to me it suggests that context is really important. We published a, we conducted a study that got a fair bit of media attention at the time in the Annals of Behavioral Medicine. And what we did in this study, this was a survey-based study, um, and we asked adults across the, uh, the age span about their preferences to exercise on their own. So what you'll see at the bottom on the x-axis are these different age groups, those in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s and above. And there were, there were no differences in their preferences to exercise alone. When we then asked them about their preferences to exercise with people in the 20s and 30s, so these are typical exercise classes, not surprisingly those in the 30s reported a preference, a positive preference for that setting, but those who are older actually reported a dislike of those settings. Now when we asked about preferences to exercise with those in their 40s and 50s, unsurprisingly perhaps those in their 40s and 50s reported a strong preference, but those of the uh, older end of the age spectrum reported a dislike, but what's particularly germane here is that when we ask older adults about their preferences to our exercise with those who are their own age, they actually reported a very positive preference to exercise in those settings, but a dislike for exercising with those much younger than themselves. So it's not that older adults dislike groups, it's just they dislike the more typical exercise programs that happen, say, at the YMCA's that, that we see in North America. So in addition to these um, age-related preferences, we also conducted some follow-up work where we looked at preferences for gender type, uh, gender composition in terms of gender segregated, so male-only and female-only classes um, versus integrated, so mixed, uh, mixed gender classes. And both men and women reported a preferences for uh, gender segregated classes to exercise in general with the, those of the, the same gender. Now, we're not saying that this is applicable for everyone, but in general, people report these preferences to exercise with those of the same gender. And these effects are particularly pronounced when we look at those who are overweight and obese relative to normal weight. So those who are overweight and obese have a particularly strong preference to, to be active with those of the same gender as themselves. One of the limitations of this work, however, that this is based on self-report data, but it also doesn't shed any light on how that might translate into their adherence behaviors. So we conducted some follow-up work where we looked at uh, the relationships between uh, within group similarity and also in particular in relation to age similarity and their adherence behaviors. One of the challenges of doing work when you do anything that's survey-based is that as soon as any one person within the group chooses not to participate, 
then you have missing data. And, and those who, who are less likely to um, complete questionnaires are often those who are much more dissimilar to others. So we conducted this study that was based on archival data. So we had intact groups and data on every single member of these groups. So if you look at this representation, and this is just a visual representation, and if we think of each of these circles as being reflective of a group, and we sample these different group-based programs in Canada. And if you think of each group, um, each think of each group, and each of these lines represents the, the difference between each individual within the group and every other person within the group. And so we calculated what are called Euclidean distance scores. So that corresponds to the difference in age between each person in the group and everyone else. And what we found was that after we controlled for their actual age, age similarity, so how similar those folks were in terms of the age, predicted their adherence over time. So what we did, we then built on this work and we conducted um, an experimental study. So this draws, and all of this work ties to this notion of, you know, birds of a feather sticking together. And we were interested whether, in, in the context of older adults, do older birds of a feather stay active together? So at the time, that study that was published in the Annals of Behavioral Medicine, one of the um, participants in a program out of West Vancouver um, phoned me up and said, hey, you've got to come and check out what we're doing in West Vancouver in the Fit Fellows program. And they developed this program without any psychologists uh, chipping in, but it was a very organic program, but it was developed by older adults, for older adults, but men in particular. And they inadvertently harness a lot of core psychological principles. So you'll see that, um, so it's just for men. They also um, wore specific t-shirts on certain days and they really foster the sense of within group uh, connectivity. And the levels of adherence really reflect, a, uh, I'd not seen anything that was comparable in North America. So they'd had about 45% of the participants had been adherent for 10 years or more, and 70% had been adherent for five years or more. And that was really quite outstanding. We know that one of the big issues within exercise and health psychology is a, a lot of people drop out, certainly within six months of starting these programs. So we worked with these folks, and, but we were interested in seeing, could we take some of these principles and apply it to other demographics? So that the geographical area where the Fit Fellows operates is West Vancouver. If any of you know West, uh, West Vancouver, it's a very high socioeconomic status um, part of um, Vancouver, uh, very uh, high um, in terms of uh, ethnicity, it's very Caucasian. And we were interested in looking to see if the, the principles could be applied to other groups. So we developed and um, tested uh, a randomized controlled trial which is called the group-based physical activity for older adults or goal trial i know probably like many psychologists we like our acronyms and perhaps it was a little cheeky trying to squeeze in all those words into the acronym for goal but what was interesting in particular is we developed t-shirts to foster the sense of um, in-group uh, connectivity and, and these these t-shirts these six dollar t-shirts really became seen as uh, um, gold dust that folks were then phoning us up afterwards to see if we had any of these later. Anyway, I'll talk to that in a minute. So in terms of the study, this was what's called a three-arm randomized trial, so where we partnered with the YMCA in uh, Greater Vancouver, and we registered our hypotheses beforehand. So it was very clear what we were indicating we were expecting to see, and then we, we then looked to test those hypotheses. So what we did is we had three conditions, that in each condition they were matched for duration, intensity, the types of the classes and exercise that were involved. Those classes were 50 to 60 minutes in length. And so if participants took part in those classes, by definition, they would be exceeding Canada's guidelines of 150 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous intensity. So the three conditions were this. The first was a similar age, same gender. So older adults exercising with other older adults, and they were, uh, they were matched in, in terms of gender. So men with men, women, women with women. The second was a similar age, mixed gender condition, so older adults exercising with older adults, but then they were mixed with men exercising with women. And then we had a mixed age, mixed gender, which is our standard comparison or our control condition. So older adults who are randomized to this condition were able to pick any of the group-based classes that were offered in the Ys in Greater Vancouver. And this was a six-month trial. And before I come to some of the um, the findings, 
what I'll, I'll highlight some of the key components of this. So what we did here is uh, we developed uh, classes and exercises that had both a high intensity and a lower intensity version of this. And then we bundled these into to, together. So we had one that was entitled Adios Arthritis, one that was called Spectacular Backsides. Um, and then as you'll see from the slide in front of you here, we had both a high intensity version and a lower intensity version. So each participant can could pick and choose how they wanted to engage in these exercises. We also picked music that was uh, more amenable to to be preferred by those 65 and older as opposed to those in their 20s and 30s that one, one might typically see in exercise programs. Um, below is actually the website that we have for the trial, it's still active, so if, if any of you are interested in just seeing what sorts of act, act, activities and exercises can be done at home with minimal equipment, which is particularly pertinent in a, in a pandemic context, and I'll talk more about that work later, but if you're interested in this, the, the link is below, and then there's a whole slew of these mini um, uh, films that, or, or slides that you can look at to see how to engage in these exercises um, safely. And you'll see that each of those exercises are, are led by older adults themselves. So in terms of the, the, the two um, theory driven, so informed by social identity theory, this notion of birds of a feather staying active together. So all of the classes in those two conditions were led by older adults. We, we train those up, but they weren't, they weren't the 20, 30 something uh, YMCA employees. We recruited volunteers that were older adults themselves. We provided quite extensive training for them. We provided t-shirts that had the logo of the program and had, a, had uh, four individuals that were in a circle sort of holding hands to foster this notion of, or at least exemplify this notion of being in a group. And then what we also did that was, I think, quite different from a way that a lot of other exercise programs are done, we also fostered this real sense of connectivity after classes would, were, were over. So they would get together for a coffee, cinnamon buns on people's birthdays. You know, they would sing, you know, sing happy birthday. There was a acapella group that formed as well. One of the things that I think our field largely fails in is that we often see our goal is to get people to become and stay active. And once we've got them active, we then think we've done our job and walk away. Whereas what we saw here is we saw that the, the exercise group simply as a means of fostering a sense of connectivity and whereby people would, would come to the program um, to connect and then the, the physical activity piece was the hook. And they often you know, hung out a fair bit afterwards. What's interesting when we were recruiting for our current um, scope trial and i'll talk a bit about that in a moment we had participants who six uh, uh it was 2014 15 so six almost seven years later is still getting together and still connecting with those that took part in this program so this really points to the the value of these exercise classes having these spillover effects in terms of the findings what we've so what we have here are three um the three conditions, the mixed age, mixed gender on the left, that's the control condition, the same age, mixed gender in the middle, and the same age, same gender on the right. So there are a few things I just want to draw your attention to. First of all, we found no differences in their, their attendance, their adherence between men and women. They were comparable across the three conditions. What we did find was that in the two um, theory informed the social identity conditions on the right, the same age mixed gender and the same age same gender conditions, they adhered to a greater extent than the comparison control condition. Now, although the bars look slightly different in terms of the two intervention conditions, there were no difference. Now, we actually hypothesized beforehand that the same age, same gender would outperform the same age mixed gender uh, conditions. So that finding was contrary to what we hypothesized beforehand. So when taken together, what this points to the fact or the likelihood is that it's perhaps less important to set up groups on the contest in the context of same gender composition, but it is important to set up groups that are uh, matched with regard to age so that older adults have the opportunity to exercise with other older adults. And in terms of the, the, the absolute difference is in, a, in attendance between the same age mixed gender and the mixed age mixed gender equated to about 10 hours difference in physical activity over six months. And that's a non-trivial effect that really is quite substantive. Okay, so in addition to 
looking at these overall effects, we were interested in what were some of the potential mechanisms that might explain those differences. So we assessed measures of group cohesion over time. We found that shortly after they were randomized to the two diff to the to the three conditions, those in the two uh, uh, age match conditions were immediately more cohesive, and they continued to get more cohesive over time by the by the 24 week mark. We also tested cohesion as a what's called an explanatory variable or a mediator. So all a mediator is, is the pathway through which one variable has an effect on, on, a, on a given outcome. So what we found for both the same age mixed gender and the same age, same gender conditions, those groups were much more cohesive than the standard comparison control condition, the mixed age, mixed gender condition. And as a result of being more cohesive, being more united, they tended to be, tended to be more adherent. One finding that I'll uh, share corresponds to something that came out before we even looked at our data. So shortly after, a couple of months after the trial finished, and we worked with the YMCA in Greater Vancouver to develop a bit of a succession plan. So after these uh, goal uh, classes finished, they would have the opportunity to, to, to still be engaged in these um, group-based conditions for older adults. And what the YMCA ended up doing is saying, well, we're not going to keep the goal uh, classes, but you can take uh, any of the classes that we have here. So a journalist from the Vancouver Sun phoned me up and said, are you aware of what's happened at the, uh, the YMCA's? And anyway, proceeded to tell me that um, these older adults had petitioned the Y, demanded that their older adult programs be retained. And this, um, and this piece came up in the Vancouver Sun, which then spurred the, the YMCA to then employ program officers to then still run these older adult um, focused classes. So this really points to the, the power A of advocacy among older adults that they were able to make this happen, but also the power of groups and these socially connected groups that it was so important to these older adults, they, they, were, they, they were quite a persuasive uh, unit in making these programs um, stay in place.